Hi, I'm Jane Marks and this is From the Heart. This week we have a very, very special guest joining us. He is one of the most famous American singers, songwriters, band leaders, record producers, actors, writers, fathers, grandfathers, and husbands. This multi-talented giant has reinvented himself, not only in his music, but in his personal life. And so for many teens, this will be an introduction to a very special world. Well, for those of us who are familiar with his body of work, prepare to be inspired. Join me in welcoming the godfather of funk, the incomparable George Clinton. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> George, thank you so much What's for joining us today. How you doing? Oh, we're so happy to have you with us. It's good to see you again, girl. <laughs> you know, you was uh, one of the first people we met when we moved down here back in uh, 99. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, now, George, you started your career in the 1950s, and since then, you have built a legacy that spans generations. And, you know, your music is just basically timeless. Your artistry is timeless. And it has resonated across so many different cultures and generations. you got to talk about that. You know what? About a week ago, I was in New Jersey. And uh, I went by to see all the schools that I went to as grade school because I started Parliament in 1956. Avon Avenue Grade School. I just went by there the other day to take pictures from that, the three, four schools that I went to in New Jersey. Met the new um, principal of school. She just happened to be out front, her, her and her husband. And we was taking pictures and she came over and I told her about we started Parliament there. Is that right, in elementary school? Elementary school. That's gonna resonate with people who watch this show. I was mm -hmm. 14 years old when we started Parliament. We were singing doo-wops love songs up under the street lights on the corner in New York, New Jersey. That was the thing back then. You know, I love this because, you know, our show is designed for teenagers in general and their families. So this story is one for the ages. Well, I mean, it's like one of the many times I can remember that I, where kids were the ones in charge of things. In the beginning of rock and roll, it was teeny boppers, you know, bubble gum, that's what they called us. and I watched that happen again in the 60s when, um, you know, hippies was happening. By then we were Parliament and Funkadelic. Mm -hmm. We had went from the doo-wop singers to uh, our own band. We was at Motown. Motown. We, Motown was like the end of the world for us. That could never be nothing better than Motown. I still swear by Motown. Oh, so do Smoke, I. <laughs> Smokey Robinson and Stevie and all of them. They were all kids and we were all, you know, in our teens. And that was... Um, so, so did you know some of these artists? I know them all. Oh, wow. We drove from New Jersey in a old Pontiac car, you know, in the, and sat out there in front and watched Temptations as they come to work, watch the Four Tops. They were all just getting started. Martha and the Vandellas. Martha and the Vandellas. I know her. <laughs> she, she was a secretary. She hadn't even got hit records yet. Wow. She was the one that interviewed us and we auditioned for her. I ended up working for, you know, as a songwriter. We didn't make it as a group because uh -huh. they already had all the groups they needed. So we went back and we changed our thing and got us a hit record. I want to testify. You probably remember that. That was our first hit record. Of course yeah. I know I want to testify. <laughs> okay, that was the first I'm one. seasoned like you, George. <laughs> okay. That was our first hit record. But then as soon as we got the hit record, we had to change styles mm -hmm. because Motown was peaking at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, the Jacksons was just coming in. You know, it was beginning to be a whole new thing. Diana Ross went to L.A. to make the movie. Lady Sing the Blues. So Detroit was changing. So we had to change our style because the rock and roll from Europe was coming. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin. That was the new hard-hitting thing that was hitting. So we had to get some of that. So we... I, so you had to add your own flavor and your own touch so that it would resonate with the audience. With the kids, so we got our right. little friends in the barber. I was a barber at the time you were doing hair. So you had they, many jobs. Yeah, all had many jobs. Yeah. And uh, we got the kids, we got them guitars. They learned to play within a couple of years. Before, you know, with the doo-wop, all they had to do was just strum, 
and we sang all the parts. But by a year later, after we got into it, Jimi Hendrix was the thing, rock and roll. Lit. So Eddie Hazel was 15 years old. I got him a guitar, 15. got him all of the Jimi Hendrix records, and everybody that was doing, you know, Led Zeppelin, Cream, and all that. Let him learn that. A year or two into, you know, the 70s, we were Funkadelic in Parliament by then. We were, had a whole new thing going on. By 22, we was teaching the, the young kids to play for us. Wow. Because all all, then all you needed was a guitar and he lead the band. Then we got a bass player and a guitar and a drummer. So we had three pieces. And so we could actually play our own stuff for, and became like a rock, R&B band, but rock. You know, played real loud. That's the difference. We just turn, <laughs> turn the amps up real loud, and you know, now we're a rock band. So Funkadelic became, you know, the Maggot Brains and the Free Your Mind, Your Ass Will Follow. That became a new thing. We had that, and then after that, we went back to Parliament, mm -hmm. and we did the Up for the Downstroke in Chocolate City. So by then, we had a whole new conscious thing because you know the, 50, the 60s brought about that revolution of you know the hippies so okay that's what's happening now well we got to get aware of, you know see what we done learn we learned a lot from all the young kids you know the hippie marches and things and like by that time we were in our 30s and i had three you know, kids you know but it was time to change again and by then i realized that kids always brought the new thing whether you liked it or not you know, it always get on your nerve when you're older to hear what the kids are doing because they sound like, you know, garbage. The same thing my mother said to us when we was running around talking about bow, 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 bow. <laughs> now I know what that sounded like to her, you know, years later when you hear <laughs> It's the same kids going to do their thing. And it's basically to get on your nerve and get you out of there. And so I found out as soon as it started getting on my nerve, I want it. Mm -hmm. That's how I figure. That's how I make sure I don't miss nothing. I'll know it when they get on my nerve because it's taking your place. You know what's interesting <laughs> to me is that you're also listening to the tone of adolescents and teenagers, and you're listening to what they're saying, and then you incorporate that into your work. Yeah, you have to. It's the new way of speaking. That's all it is. They they want their own language. They don't want you listening in on their conversation. So now you got your iPhones and everything. It's a whole new world. Now you have to learn how they talk. Matter of fact, I just call them and tell me, show me how you're doing this. Show me how you're doing that. And once you get into that, uh -huh. you know their language. At least you kind of like and understand where they're coming from. Uh -huh. It ain't so deep. It's, to me, it's like but the third time I done seen, fourth time I done seen a new generation start. And right now, talking to Snoop, he's like Uncle Snoop. <laughs> Snoop Dogg. He's like Uncle Snoop now. Uh -huh. You know, when, when he started, he was like little kid, you know. And I was Uncle George, Uncle G, and, you know, all of that. But now, I mentioned Snoop to kids. They, huh? I said, oh, that's right. Y'all, 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 even Kendrick Lamar probably sound old to y'all. Well, you know, you, you know you, what here's what you're talking about. George, you're talking about a family, a community, a sense of musicians. You know, and you're telling us about how you built the history, about how you felt connected. And, you know, to our audience, you might want to know, we are here at the home of George Clinton. And so, yeah. you know, we're going to continue with this conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We are here with the incredible indomitable George Clinton ooh, talking ooh. about his music and his <laughs> ongoing legacy. Uh, we've talked so much about the longevity that he's enjoyed as a musician and I think much of this is, is due just like you were saying to your you know, ability to evolve you know and where you know you said that part of your inspiration is certainly from the young people and listening but that's not all of it your inspiration because I've seen you do some incredible things well, like I said, I started out with, with a, a hell of an example to live up to. Motown was it. The 50s, 60s was the beginning of rock and roll. And to, to actually live up to all those people that that started right around that, you know, I'm, I can say it's, I can start with Sam Cooks and 
um, Marvin Gaye's and all the Motown, and then Jackie Wilson's and Blues, B.B. King, all of that I had a chance to look at before, you know, and to see that the kids that was making the hit records were relating to the musicians that my mother liked. Ah. I understood that that's the way you have to do it. Look back at the people that start, that you can get inspiration from, but also look ahead with the kids who's going to always change it. And by putting them both together, I had a lot to live up to, so the inspiration was oh, unending. Still there. Soon as I'd be ready to retire, here comes somebody come along and do something. I always prided myself on doing lyrics, you know, because Motown was specialized in lyrics, and Smokey Robinson and all that. When hip hop come along, now you got, you know, you got um, Rakim. And Eminem, I knew as a kid, about 15 years old, back in Detroit when he was first getting started. Mm -hmm. He ain't never stopped being great. Mm -hmm. So I always be ready to retire and then somebody like them come along and do something you would. Man, I wish I'd have done that. And I ain't let, I ain't going out like that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go back and do some more because I'm hard-headed, you know. And so I end up like having something else to aspire to do. At 70, I was aspiring to, to, you know, to keep up with the Rock Kims and the Kendrick Lamars. And I did a record with Kendrick. He did one with me, you know. And so Snoop and all of us, we all I feel like they're my age. We've been around this so long. George, did you know that this is Black Music History Month? And you have given us a chronology of so many of the important musicians you know, certainly in our history and who have brought us where we are today, but you are central and a part of that. Well, I'll tell you what, you know Ben Crump. I do. He's a frat brother of mine, and uh, he's also our new attorney general. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But he and I, we, we're getting ready to open up a foundation for black music the awareness so we can let people know about copyright recaptures and all the the information that kids need Young that I didn't get, right. you know, until I was way past probably a half a billion dollars taken away from me before I realized I wasn't paying no attention to the business part. I love the music so much, I didn't keep my eye on that, but I, I'm getting it back because of copyright recapture. You can do that, and once I did it, it's been to help me let other people know you know, I it could be done, and so I'm, everybody wrote with me. I'm trying to help them get their rights back. I'm giving all that I got. I'm giving it back to them if I control it, mm -hmm. and I'll let them know. And that's going to be our thing, Black Music History Month. We're going to do that every year. Notify people whose copyrights is due been, to come back. Right, that have been taken away. Yeah, and it's, right. it's due to come back. To, if you don't know that it's due to come back, you won't never try to get it back. Right. You know, you ain't got to go for that. I got some money for it, it ain't mine no more. That's not true. Mm -hmm. it, the law is it come back to you after 35 years. Wow. You know, since 1978, that's the new law. So we're trying to make sure everybody understand that. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss a minute of this conversation today. It's pretty special. Well, we're back once more with George Clinton. And the fight for social justice has been going on for centuries in this country. You've lived through the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, and now we are here 60 years later, George, and in the middle of yet another social movement, Black Lives Matter movement. And in the past, how have you seen music play a role in social justice, and certainly in your music? So when it comes to social justice, I think I got educated, you know, around the Woodstock time. You know, at that show, everybody was, you know, liberated. Um, black, gay, women, everybody got together. They merged together, merged right? together I remember that. And that made it so strong. And so you, you started seeing all the songs that was coming from it. You know, Stevie, The Beatles. Um, uh, what's his name, Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. you know, all of, so all of a sudden you got Marvin Gaye and Motown, that is which they didn't really want you to get into politics. Mm -hmm. You know, it was about business. But Marvin and Stevie, 
you know, followed us. We went off into, I got a thing, you got a thing, free your mind, your ass will follow. America eats its young. So we started being really political. And provocative. And provocative. I mean, right, America eats its young would scare you. You couldn't even probably do it today. Mm -hmm. That was the name of the album. It was a nice, we were talking about it. But we were talking about social. We were talking biological. We was all up into that level of consciousness. So it was really out there. You couldn't even do that nowadays. The way we were talking about America eats its young. We were talking about the Vietnam War and people coming home from the war. So social justice, I got aware of it back then. And after that, you saw all the different places that it changed. It got worse after a while. It got better for a minute. But as soon as ain't nobody looking, money started overriding everything. <laughs> and it goes right back to what it is now. And we're here again, 60 years later. I thought we did this. Right. I thought this was done back then. Absolutely. And that's what we're talking about in terms of things coming full circle. And they're trying to go further back than the 50s now. I mean, they're not, there's no shame in trying to get rid of uh, voting rights. That's like, we got rid of that for real in the 60s. Not got rid of it, but... We were able to vote in we the 60s, able right. To move up and they, no, they're trying to go back without any Any shame, qualms about it. Any shame. On it. So yeah, no, social justice and all that. I'm glad to be working with Ben now because I have to learn my part. I told him I'll be there by his side to, for whatever I can do. I, I ain't no preacher. I don't do that, but I'm there to lend support because um, it's really that time nowadays, time for us to get our equity back. I mean, like I said, in copyrights, that's wealth we can pass down to our kids. We can't, the same way we can't pass land down because we're not able to keep it, we can't pass the copyrights of, of the music down to our kids because we didn't know what to do. Now, we're making that available to people. You know, what's important here, though, is that I think you're also a spokesman, as we listen to you, a spokesman for social justice like we never imagined. I mean, would you imagine at 80 years old that you're out oh, front hell no. and center. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't imagine doing that at 80 years, at 80. But then when I stop and think about it, yeah, I said, well, that's best. That's, that's a way to be in the limelight, too. That's, that's part of it, you know, and I got energy. That's right. Yeah, you know I mean, I got energy, but uh, in you, by that time, you got grandkids and great grand. I got great grandkids. That you know, it's interesting because I think it's important that our audience know that they're also part of your band. Oh no, the they're a big part of the band. Right. All, all kids and grandkids and their friends is the the new Parliament Funkadelic. Even though they do their own thing individually, uh -huh. they are actually the Parliament Funkadelic with the musicians that we all, you know, not you my trained. age, but they're all, almost my age. We got the band still there, but we got them out front doing what the people relate to, mm -hmm. to in today's TikTok world, mm -hmm. you know, so, so they know how to relate to that. Mm -hmm. And we still can do, the songs hold up to all of this. I mean, Atomic Dog, Dog Timeless, Atomic Dog, Timeless, Timeless, Q Timeless. Dogs, or right. whoever else, you know, anybody else. We was on Trolls, you know, the Disney thing, Trolls. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, doesn't that speak volumes? King for Quincy, I played King Quincy on that. Okay. Right, right. And Anderson, we, Anderson we, Pack, and uh, I mean Timberlake, they're all part of singing Atomic Dog with me. You know, this speaks volumes for an art, artist, a musician who has crossed generations, and we see now why he's been so, so, so successful. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We are once again here with the legendary George Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, a large part of our audience here uh, from the heart are, is made up of teens and, and young adults and, and some people who are just not that aware of your history. But as you look back over your life, George, and, and you think about the challenges that you've overcome and what you've been through, what advice would you give to your teenage self? Wow. I think of all the things that I could say that I would advise against or for at any given point in my life, but seeing how it played, how it played out, how it's playing out, 
I think anything changed would have affected what happened after that. So I'm, I'm thinking that I would trust the funk like I did before, and I rely on the funk like you know, like Scott, Luke Skywalker say, "Trust the force, Luke." <laughs> I say you trust the funk. I trust the funk. You know what I'm saying? And what I, how I wiggled out or into whatever I got into or out of, I'm happy where I'm at right now. And I'm happy in a good way, you know, that um, I don't think I would change anything knowing, you know, not knowing what I would have done. And then in how its far place. you come, right? Yeah, in its place, right. you know, so I'm going to leave well enough alone. <laughs> <laughs> And that's interesting because what you're saying is you trust your instincts, you trust your gut, you know, that whatever life presents with you, you just roll with it, but you do it in the best way possible. I, 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 used to, I always say to, to the kids and people, do the best you can and then funk it. <laughs> okay. I mean, leave it alone. You can literally leave it alone once you've done that. Once you know you've done the best you can, you ain't got to feel no guilt about what you didn't do, what you should have done. You've done the best you can. That's, as, that's the best you can do. Anything after that, you're going in the other direction again. <laughs> you know, you can mess up on top of messing up. And, you know, I tell, I tell you know, of course, you know that I'm a family therapist and I've been working for teens for years. And I always tell teens, you don't ever make huge mistakes. You make decisions. And then you move on from there. And moving forward, what are you going to do about it, right? I mean, if you messed up, don't do it again. Try, try to clean it up the next time. There's a, there's a more important lesson here, and that is you have continued to reinvent yourself in a way that, is, that just is so meaningful to what is going on right, even today right now in this country. Oh, that, that, that helped you being able to smile about it. You find new ways. You ain't in love with none of the styles uh, we've been through. I mean, I like, love them all, but I ain't in love with no, no particular style of music. Or, um, funk is being able to do anything it takes to help you enjoy it and keep on doing it. So I'm happy with what I'm doing all the time. So it keeps me motivated, you know, and finding new ways to do it. And if it looks like I'm getting old, all I got to do is look around and see what's getting on my nerve. And then you're <laughs> they got it. That's, that's where I should be. If I still think I want to be out here doing something. I mean, I found with this pandemic thing happening, I found other things to do that excites me. We're going to talk about that in the next part of the show. But... We certainly are. And, and, a whole nother story. Or I'm going to stop you right there because, as you can see, one show is just simply not enough. You've got to join us next time for part two with George Clinton, where we're going to talk about how he continues to reinvent himself, and this time as a visual artist. You won't want to miss this. We'll see you next week.